Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Daniel Benjamin. On behalf of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding, I want to welcome you to uh, Bretton Woods Then and Now, uh, a lecture with Dr. Ben Steele of the Council on Foreign Relations. This is this year's uh, Open Chain Family Great Issues Lecture, and I particularly want to thank William and Penny Open Chain uh, for their generous support. Uh, as Ben and I were discussing just a moment ago, when uh, politicians and statesmen invoke Bretton Woods, they uh, typically do so with a reverence and a loftiness that is reserved for uh, the Marshall Plan or the San Francisco Conference that laid the foundation for the Uni United Nations. And um, sometimes they do so uh, ahead of, sometimes they did so ahead of time too. I came across this quotation from Fred Vinson, later uh, uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who was uh, deputy, uh, deputy chair of our delegation, I believe, and he said, so we fight together on sodden battlefields. Of course, the war was still going on. We sail together on the majestic blue and we fly together in the ethereal sky. The test of this conference is whether we can walk together, solve our economic problems, down the road to peace as we today march to victory. Um, well, of course, the Bretton Woods Conference, which was held down the road at the Mount Washington Hotel uh, in July 1944, had more than 700 delegates from 44 allied nations, and it became a byword for that kind of enlightened and positive international cooperation that has appeared only at the rarest of times. But the reality is that it was uh, really anything but that kind of moment of, uh, of sort of Kantian peace and thoughtfulness and, and fellow feeling. Um, uh, and now at a time when we keep hearing calls for a new Bretton Woods as uh, the European uh, uh, economies are in dire straits and as the United States faces enormous debt problems and China uh, sits on a towering mountain of our own uh, uh, treasuries, uh, it's worth finding out what really happened at Bretton Woods and finding out what, uh, what lessons it holds for today. And really anything but being a, a moment of great selflessness, it was probably the moment when America laid the groundwork for its own economic preeminence for nearly two decades and sealed, uh, sealed the fate of the British Empire. Uh, I remember when I wrote my first book, my editor told me, uh, only write a book if you have great characters and fabulous anecdote. And uh, it's hard to imagine an episode in history that has much better characters and anecdotes uh, than this one from uh, uh, the two uh, chief characters, Harry Dexter White, the uh, offspring of uh, Lithuanian immigrants who by dint of extraordinary uh, exertion and uh, perspiration rose to be uh, a Mandarin in our system without, a, without an official job uh, to uh, uh, John Maynard Keynes who was, uh, at least in that time, viewed as uh, uh, economics equivalent of Albert Einstein, a lofty aristocratic figure uh, who uh, was on a first name basis with all the great and the good in, uh, in the United Kingdom. So it's a fabulous story and I'm delighted that Ben Steele has come uh, to tell it to us today and to talk about some of the relevance of, uh, of this uh, watershed moment. Uh, ben Steele is a senior fellow and director of international economics at the Council on Foreign Relations uh, in New York. He is also the founding editor of International Finance, a top scholarly journal and co-writer of the Council's Geographics Economics blog. Um, before joining the Council in 1999, he was uh, uh, at uh, Chatham House in London and he has uh, his, uh, his DPhil from Oxford and his undergraduate degree from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. He is a columnist for Dow Jones Financial News, a regular contributor at the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times. His last book, Money, Markets, and Sovereignty, was awarded the Hayek Book Prize in 2010. His current book, uh, The Battle of Bretton Woods, John Maynard Keynes and Harry Dexter White and the Making of a New World Order, came out in February. It's a fabulous read. It's gotten uh, reviews that can only turn a fellow writer's gills green. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Steele, and uh, I welcome him and thank him for coming up here. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out. It's a great honor uh, having been invited to give this year's Open Chain Lecture. Um, I can also think a few places better to talk about a famous New Hampshire conference than um, uh, Dartmouth. Uh, 
Um, Dan, you mentioned Fred Vincent. I have a better quote of Fred Vincent. Um, he was not a fan of either Keynes or White's. Um, in 1946, at the Savannah Conference to inaugurate the IMF and the World Bank, uh, Keynes made the keynote uh, address and warned the audience that it would be a terrible thing if some malicious fairy um, would allow these institutions to be taken over by a politician. Uh, Vincent was Truman's Treasury Secretary at the time, was sitting in the front row, was very angry, turned to the fellow next to him and said, you know, I don't mind being called malicious, but I do mind being called a fairy. Um, I decided um, it might be a good idea to write about Bretton Woods. Uh, back in 2009, after the financial crisis started going global, you had world leaders from French President Nicolas Sarkozy to British Prime Minister Gordon Brown all calling for a new Bretton Woods. So I thought it might be a good idea to look at the old original one. Now, I'm a financial economist by training, and uh, financial economists are always taught that if you see $20 on the ground, you're delusional because someone would have picked it up by now. Um, I'm very glad that I didn't um, uh, hew to my, my training and my instincts. I did bend down to pick it up because this was, this was a really 20 bucks on the ground. This is a great story that uh, hadn't been uh, told before. Uh, a little bit of scene setting on Bretton Woods. This um, conference takes place over the course of three weeks in July uh, 1944. It begins just three weeks after the D-Day invasion at um, Normandy. So there's sort of an enormous sense of anxious optimism among the delegates. There are over 700 delegates at Bretton Woods from um, 44 uh, nations gathered. Now, uh, FDR um, uh, viewed this event as having great political significance. He wanted to send the enemy Axis powers a message that it was the United States and the Allies who had the compelling uh, post-war uh, vision. Um, he thought that might actually serve to bring the war to an earlier conclusion. Um, why did he choose Bretton Woods? Um, uh, interesting, um, this is the most important international gathering since the Paris peace talks in 1919. And FDR very much had them in mind and what he considered to be Woodrow Wilson's biggest failing, the fact that he had failed to bring along Republicans in the Senate behind his League of Nations. And FDR was determined he wouldn't make the same mistake. Um, New Hampshire happened to have a Republican uh, senator, Charles Tobey, who was going to be in a very tough um, uh, primary battle um, uh, in the uh, autumn. The Democrats felt they had no chance um, to take that seat, but he figured that if he helped Toby out, and Toby was renowned for being an enemy of international institutions, he might not only convert Toby, but might um, bring Toby along to convert some of his fellows, and that's exactly how things uh, uh, played out. So that was the main reason why uh, Bretton Woods um, was chosen. Now, um, FDR had no interest in international monetary uh, affairs, certainly not the details of them. In that regard, he was very similar to um, Winston Churchill, who interestingly enough in his um, uh, five-volume memoirs on, on the war mentions the great economist John Maynard Keynes only once, um, even though Keynes played a, a major diplomatic um, role during, during the war. Um, uh, FDR's treasury, however, um, were the ones who scripted the conference, and they were um, what you might characterize as economic determinists. Um, this is um, Henry Morgenthau, um, the uh, treasury secretary. He's an old uh, friend of um, FDR's from uh, Hyde Park, New York. He knows nothing about um, economics, describes himself as an apple farmer, a gentleman apple farmer, but uh, an apple farmer nonetheless. Um, but he's very reliant on his deputy, um, a truly remarkable figure that I'll talk some about, Harry Dexter White. Now, these two men um, believe that um, the war came about uh, through very um, uh, specific circumstances. That is, the currency wars of the early 1930s kicked off when um, Britain left the gold exchange standard in 1931. Um, caused uh, uh, the trade wars of the early 30s to um, uh, unravel, to this spread, according to their rendition, 
the Great Depression globally and created the environment of misery and anger that allowed Hitler and Mussolini to pursue um, their wars of uh, uh, aggression. So the International Monetary Fund that they were going to create at Bretton Woods, um, which in their vision was much more important than the World Bank, um, was to be a vital complement to the United Nations that would be created the following year at um, uh, San Francisco. Um, what did uh, White think the, United, the, the International Monetary Fund that he had been the primary architect of was supposed to do? Well, this is how he described it to the American delegation before they went off into the negotiations at Bretton Woods. Mind you, many of them were, were politicians. Um, they were not schooled in economics, so it was Harry Dexter White who was tutoring them, as it were, as to um, how they should go forward into battle. He said, the fund, that is the IMF, is designed for a special purpose, and that purpose is to prevent competitive depreciations of currencies. That is to stop currency wars, a specific type of currency war, those directed at the US dollar. Um, and so they were going to do this by establishing this um, new fund which would um, manage a global dollar-based system with gold as its foundation. The dollar would be fixed to gold at um, a, a, a fixed um, a price. And um, uh, why did the U.S. Treasury in the 1940s view fixed exchange rates as being in the national interest, whereas today we constantly badger countries, and particularly, in particular China, to um, unpeg their currencies from the dollar. Well, in the 1940s, all the market pressure on the, on the U.S. dollar was upward, so th that when countries fixed their currencies to the U.S. dollar, that helped the United States maintain a more competitive currency. Um, roughly speaking, over the past 10 years, most of the market pressure on the U.S. dollar vis-a-vis -vis key emerging market currencies, particularly China's renminbi, has been downward. So when countries do the same thing, fix their currencies to the U.S. dollar, it makes it more difficult for the United States to achieve a more competitive dollar. So that's why we've changed our position on that matter. Um, now, why was the rest of the world even interested in this um, creation? Well, in the 1940s, there was no other way to, to trade and therefore to survive in the world um, other than barter without gold or U.S. dollars. And the United States controlled nearly 80% of the world's monetary gold stock at the time. So the rest of the world was really there at Bretton Woods to find out what the United States was going to do about this problem. This was not a kumbaya moment. This was the moment where the United States would explain to the world um, how um, it was going to manage the um, uh, immediate crisis that was going to take place um, uh, after the war uh, when it would be impossible to restart um, uh, trade with the U.S. Um, controlling 80 percent of the world's monetary reserves without some architecture to ensure at least um, uh, liquidity when countries got into balance of payments difficulties, which they inevitably would. Um, why did, um, was the United States um, able to entice everybody over to Bretton Woods? Well, here's how Harry Dexter White explained it to the American delegates. He said it was gold in Fort Knox. He said it was why the United States was, quote, in such a powerful position at this conference. It's why we dominate the financial world. If only England was in that position, it would be a very different story. Um, Harry Dexter White was a man who was literally obsessed with the relative um, uh, economic and political positions of the United States and Great Britain. He was since his earliest days um, uh, in government. Um, when he arrives at the U.S. Treasury in 1934, really as no, no more than a bureaucratic temp, he rolls from short-term contract to short-term contract, he's already planning an international conference. In 1935, for example, he's the key figure um, uh, who persuades the Chinese, rather ruthlessly, um, to unpeg their currency from sterling and to peg it to the U.S. dollar. And he moves steadily on this front as we go forward into the 1940s. I found a uh, memo in his um, archives dated 1936 in which he writes, quote, the more sterling countries there are in the world, 
The more countries that use the pound sterling or have their currencies linked to the pound sterling, the stronger will be England's position around a conference table should an international conference take place. So eight years before Bretton Woods, he's already planning an international conference, even though he's, again, no more than a bureaucratic temp at this point at the um, US Treasury, and it's going to be a, a conference um, at which uh, the United States, and in particular Harry Dexter White, best the British. Um, many in the FDR administration considered the United States to be the great anti-colonial uh, power in the world, and Harry Dexter White always viewed economics as being a, a, a means to political ends. He never viewed it as being a, an end in itself. He, in fact, told a friend at Stanford during his second attempt at an undergraduate degree when he was uh, 30 years old, he said he had an epiphany of sorts. He realized, as he put it, um, that most governmental problems were fundamentally economic. This is why I decided to stick with economics. Um, so Bretton Woods was very much, in Harry Dexter White's mind, um, a key tool in eliminating Great Britain as a political and economic rival in the post-war world. Um, Henry Morgenthau, after FDR died, explained to um, President Truman what it was um, he had set out to achieve at Bretton Woods. He said, quote, I wanted to move the financial center of the world from London and Wall Street to, to the United States Treasury. Note the end, Wall Street part. This is very much an anti-banker New Deal agenda writ global, and London, of course, is um, a, a key part of this. At Bretton Woods, he tells the American delegates, quote, now the advantage is ours here, and I personally think we should take it, to which Harry Dexter White adds, if the advantage was theirs, that is Britain's, they would take it. Other than the Soviet Union, and I'll talk a little, about the, a little bit about the Soviet Union, um, Britain is really the only other delegation um, at Bretton Woods who puts up any resistance to the American plan. In fact, Harry Dexter White and John Maynard Keynes really spar uh, at some, time, some points rather violently over two years in the run-up to the conference as to what the agenda will, will be and what the final articles of agreement of the International Monetary Fund will look like. But Bretton Woods is ultimately part of a, what I would describe as a Faustian bargain that Britain was um, forced to enter into with the United States in order to survive the war, in order to get American Lend-Lease aid, to get through the war, and to get a brief, small, post-war transitional loan which would get them through the first several years after the war. And the key elements of it were this. First, um, Britain would have to put an end to imperial trade preference this was the arrangement by which Britain gave itself privileged access to the markets of its colonies and dominions. Um, this was considered by um, uh, FDR's Treasury and State Department really to be an abomination on both a political and economic level. Uh, politically, it was seen as being the sort of glue of the British Empire, which they were determined to bust up after the war. And of course, economically, um, it was anathema to US uh, exporters who um, didn't have um, access to these markets. Um, second, Britain would be forced to make the pound sterling uh, convertible, again, um, at a fixed price into US dollars. Um, by a fixed date uh, after the war. That date was ultimately set at July 15, 1947. This is for the British, a day that will live in infamy uh, because it was a mortal threat to British solvency. Britain had very few dollars and very little gold um, uh, after the war. They were desperately trying to conserve it. And on July 15, 1947, the world basically converged on London and said, give us our dollars and our gold now. The U.S. hath proclaimed it. Um, and finally, um, Britain would accept the U.S. dollar as the basic unit of uh, account for global trade after the war. So this was a pretty tough deal. Why did the British ultimately accept it? Well, as British economist and delegate Lionel Robbins put it at Bretton Woods, quote, unquote, we needed the cash. It was really that simple. Um, uh, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill had famously referred to American Lend-Lease aid as, quote-unquote, the most unsorted act. 
but he was in fact well aware um, that it uh, was um, uh, being um, uh, accompanied by uh, very painful terms that were being imposed not by FDR, who again did not see economics as being a ge geopolitical tool, but by um, FDR's uh, treasury. Um, it seems remarkable perhaps in the present context, but in, uh, during World War II, uh, FDR's treasury s saw Britain as being America's natural geopolitical rival in the world and thought things would go back to normal, as it were, um, after the war, which in their conception was the world of the late 19th century. Um, it, um, the U.S. during the Second World War was actually spontaneously more generous to China and the Soviet Union um, than it was um, to Great Britain. Um, and the collapse of British imperial power after the war was very much scripted by FDR's treasury. FDR's treasury was monitoring um, Britain's foreign exchange reserves throughout the war in the immediate post-war period. And Lend-Lease aid, Lend aid, for example, was constantly um, uh, um, altered as British reserves would go up and, uh, and down because the United States, specifically the Treasury, did not want Britain to have any independent room for maneuver and any excess foreign exchange reserves would allow Britain to um, have some sort of independent role in the world. So you see in, in, uh, over the course of just a few weeks in early 1947, all the foundations of British imperial power collapsing, Burma, Greece, Palestine, India, all of them fall in a matter of weeks. And what's driving it? The loss of, of dollars. Britain's trying desperately to conserve dollars before the um, critical July 15th uh, date. Now, I think it's worth emphasizing that the broad vision at Bretton Woods that Morgenthau and, and White um, brought were, for all intents and purposes, overthrown entirely just three years later in the early part of the Truman administration under the Marshall Plan. These are what I think are the four foundations of this vision that Morgenthau and White brought to Bretton Woods. Um, uh, first, that um, Britain's empire could be peaceably dismantled. Second, that the Soviet Union could be co-opted into a permanent peacetime alliance. Third, that Germany could be safely dismembered and deindustrialized. This is the so-called Morgenthau plan for post-war Germany. And finally, that short-term IMF loans would be sufficient to restart global multilateral trade after the war. Um, fast forward um, to early 1947, and all this is turned on its head. Here is how um, uh, Dean Acheson, Truman's future Secretary of State, described it. He said that those assumptions had been based on, quote unquote, misconceptions of the state of the world around us, both in anticipating post-war conditions and in recognizing what they actually were when we came face to face with them. Only slowly did it dawn upon us that the whole world structure and order that we had inherited from the 19th century was gone and that the struggle to replace it would be directed from two bitterly opposed and ideologically irreconcilable power centers. So what are the pillars of the U.S. post-war vision now? First, Britain is no geopolitical um, rival. Britain is a desperate ally that needs to be saved from Im imminent collapse and a potential communist takeover. Uh, two, the Soviets can no longer be co-opted, but in George Kennan's f famous word, needed to be contained. Uh, three, West Germany um, uh, would be turned into the Western bulwark against Soviet expansion. Germans would be rehabilitated, and West Germany would be turned into the industrial center of a new integrated Western Europe, Western Europe being very much an American geopolitical concept. And finally, the whole idea of uh, an IMF um, trying to um, support a dollar-starved world through short-term loans, that's all ditched. Um, Truman mothballs the IMF um, uh, entirely, and it's replaced with the Marshall Plan. So loans are replaced with the idea of massive 
grants in aid. This is a radical change of thinking for the United States. If any of you are, are seeing some potential parallels with the Eurozone today, I think they're there. Germany is very much, in my view, in the 1944 um, uh, phase that the United States was in. That is, the um, uh, crisis um, hit countries in the south of the Eurozone can be supported for years with more and more uh, loans being piled on, more and more um, uh, debt. For me, the only question is when they finally um, accept that um, uh, this is untenable and either allow the thing to the um, uh, European Union to break up or they try to save it in much the same way that the United States did with um, Western Europe in 1947. Some big issues there, but let me move on and uh, talk a bit about the two main characters at Bretton Woods. John Maynard Keynes and Harry Dexter White um, Tony Barber of the um, FT, who reviewed the book, um, said that they were as different, as, as he put it, as bourbon and afternoon tea. And it, it, indeed, you couldn't have um, uh, two protagonists um, who were, were more different in background and temperament than, than these two. John Maynard Keynes, um, born in 1883, of an upper middle class uh, Cambridge uh, academic uh, family. He was raised by a governess and servants. He was expected to go on to do great things in the world. Um, Harry Dexter White, born nine years later, 1892, the youngest of seven children of Lithuanian Jewish immigrants. His father was a hardware peddler. Um, his parents died when he was quite young, his mother when he was nine, his father when he was 16. He actually dropped out of college during his first attempt in order to go back into the family um, hardware business and only went back at age 30. Um, these two men have a grudging admiration for each other. Um, uh, Keynes doesn't like White personally at all. He said of him, quote, he has not the faintest conception how to behave or observe the rules of civilized intercourse. He referred to the first draft that Harry Dexter White produced for Bretton Woods as, quote unquote, the work of a lunatic or some sort of bad joke. Um, but he knew that the man was enormously influential within the Roosevelt administration. Why was that? Morgan, um, FDR, as uh, most of you are aware, had uh, little time for the opinions of his cabinet, but he would listen to Morgenthau because Morgenthau was a friend. But Morgenthau was not the sharpest tack in the box. He didn't have any original ideas of his own. These ideas all came from one man, including on foreign policy. White was enormously influential in foreign policy uh, during the um, Second World War. And, and, and uh, Keynes understood this. Um, for White's part, um, he worshiped Keynes as a thinker. Um, he used to get himself literally physically sick before he would go into negotiations with Keynes because he didn't want to humiliate himself in front of his colleagues. But when the two would come together for a negotiating session, you can almost feel in their um, uh, discourse the disparity in their backgrounds and their consciousness of it. Um, one point in a particularly explosive episode in October of 1943, Keynes takes a new draft from White, throws it on the ground and yells, this is intolerable, it is yet another Talmud. Uh, Keynes was very conscious of the fact that White was Jewish, his top deputies, Eddie Bernstein, for example, were Jewish, of course Morgenthau himself was Jewish, uh, to which White responds, we will try to produce something which your highness can understand. <laughs> Um, Keynes at Bretton Woods was the world's first ever celebrity economist. We're very used to these characters today. You know, people like Paul Krugman and Norio Rubini who jet around the world with the media waiting on their every pronouncement. But this was a real novelty in 1944 at Bretton Woods. Keynes was truly the media idol of the event. And Bretton Woods was very much a, 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 a media uh, event. There was an enormous press contingency there. The Americans very much resented this. They tried desperately to keep Keynes away from the media. For example, Morgenthau would, would not let him near the podium for the opening ceremonies. The British graciously offered to have Lord Keynes nominate Morgenthau to be the president of the conference, and Morgenthau vetoed it. He did, would not let um, uh, Keynes even speak at the opening ceremonies. White, for his, his part, relegated Keynes to the commission to create the World Bank. 
because the United States had no interest in the World Bank at that point. There were no major issues dividing um, them in the UK, and he wanted to keep them, them away from the main event, which was establishing the International Monetary Fund, which would uh, be dominated by the United States, which would have unique veto power within the fund, and would preside over a dollar-based international monetary system. Keynes had fought for years with White about this. He wanted to create a new supranational currency, which he would call Bancor, that he hoped would eventually supplant the US dollar. Now, I should, I should emphasize that Keynes was an internationalist, but he was fundamentally an internationalist Englishman. He was an Englishman at heart. And there is no way that he would have proposed Bancor at Bretton Woods if he had believed that there was some way to salvage Sterling's dominant international role. But that was out of the question um, at, at that point. So really, you're in a situation where um, uh, the rival of my rival's currency is my friend. Um, so that's, that's where Bancor comes from. And of course, White will have none of it. Um, Keynes is extremely astute in understanding the situation that he and Great Britain um, are in. He explains to the British government in the early 1940s that British freedom to engineer new post-war social and economic policies was, quote unquote, impossible without further American assistance. The country's room for maneuver was painfully limited, he says, the Americans are strong enough to offer inducements to many or most of our friends to walk out on us. But he also warns them of the need to, quote, guard against the present emergency being used as an opportunity for picking out the eyes of the British Empire and to prevent Britain becoming a satellite of the United States. He said, there were quarters in the United States intending to use the grant of post-war credits to us as an opportunity for imposing upon us the American conception of the international economic system. So he knows what's going on here. Having said that, um, despite the fact that the man is pr probably the most brilliant economist alive, He's very astute in understanding the limited room for maneuver his country has. He is the world's worst diplomat. Um, every mission, diplomatic mission, that Keynes ever made to the United States was a begging mission, from World War I to World War II. But he never behaved as a supplicant. The man was um, uh, irascible. He was condescending. Um, he was constantly. Uh, annoying the uh, um, uh, Americans and making them less disposed to make concessions. Um, his first official trip to Washington was during World War I. He was working for the uh, Treasury uh, at the time, so he's about 35 years old. In September of 1917, he goes to Washington, and here are the comments that come back about his performance. The man was, quote, unquote, rude, dogmatic, and disobliging and quote unquote, too offensive for words. These comments came from the British ambassador and his financial secretary. <laughs> the Americans said much worse uh, uh, about him. Um, but the question really has to be asked, look, given the cards that he was dealt, could anyone have done a better job than he did? Because he certainly came away from Bretton Woods empty handed. He came back after the war. Um, uh, when he was looking for post-war transitional assistance from the United States, empty-handed. He had told the British government that it would be a moral abomination to accept another loan from the Americans. Yet by the end of the negotiations, he was begging London to take the loan on American terms. Could anybody have done better? Uh, and my answer is yes. It was a grievous mistake to send Keynes as a diplomat. And that was because the man had a personal stake in the outcome. Senior civil servants in Britain, many of them the most prominent of which um, Sir Richard Clark, Otto Clark in the Treasury, were scathing about Keynes's approach. Clark in particular said Keynes should never have pursued this idea of a quote unquote grand design. He said Bretton Woods was all fine and good for some point in the future, but what we needed now was transitional assistance to get through the war and to keep the empire together, not out of rom rom romantic uh, 
um, uh, interest, but to keep us alive. Um, and we could have gotten this from other sources with no geopolitical strings attached. Clark argued that we could have borrowed the money privately. We could have borrowed some of it from the Export-Import Bank in the United States, which didn't have a geopolitical uh, agenda. We could have borrowed more from the Canadians. Now the question is, was he right? And my answer is yes. The archives suggest that he was certainly right. For example, in May of 1944, just before Keynes leaves for Bretton Woods, the British financial secretary goes to New York to meet with a prominent group of New York bankers. These bankers are very anti-New Deal. Um, they are very much against the idea of the IMF, and they offer the British financial secretary a deal. We will assemble for you a loan of at least $3 billion in return for which you walk away from this conference. And the financial secretary was very interested, and he cables Keynes and says, you know, this is something we need to consider. And Keynes dismisses it out of hand, and he does so repeatedly in the run-up to ultimate Brit British ratification of Bretton Woods. And why does he do it? In my view, because he's very concerned with his personal legacy. He wants to be known as the man who overthrew the gold standard. He doesn't of course, want White's architecture to come to predominate at Bretton Woods, but he believes that the world will eventually come to see sense and will implement his plan rather than White's. And there was something to that. For example, in 2009, the uh, Chinese central bank governor, Zhou, produced this rather remarkable statement saying that Bretton Woods was a terrible mistake and we should have pursued the Keynes plan rather than the White plan. Of course, that was uh, much later than Keynes would have liked um, a, a major creditor power to come to that um, uh, conclusion, but this was what Keynes believed, and it was false. Um, and so I think he was the wrong man to choose for the job. Uh, let me say a bit about um, Harry Dexter White, who in my view is one of the most fascinating American political figures of the 20th century that nobody really knows anything about. As I mentioned, he comes from uh, very humble uh, origins. Um, but he, he, he's clearly an extraordinarily intelligent um, man, and he views um, his... Uh, intellectual accomplishments as being by far as most important. He's not a technically brilliant economist, but he's a master at translating econo economic ideas into policy. In his own entry in Who's Who, um, there's nothing in his life at all up until the time that he gets his doctorate in economics from Harvard. Nothing. It's like all those years don't exist. And he's nearly 40 years old by this time. But he can't get tenure there. Um, so he goes off to a little college in Wis Appleton, Wisconsin, Lawrence College, now Lawrence University. He's quite unhappy there. Um, what is he planning to do? Well, a little context. This is a man who's always been fascinated with what we might call non-mainstream politics. In 1924, for example, he was a passionate supporter of fighting Bob LaFollette's independent progressive party campaign for the presidency on a platform of ending U.S. imperialism in Latin America and nationalizing key industries. He tells his former supervisor at Harvard, Frank Tausig, that he's studying Russian and is trying to get a scholarship to go to Moscow to study economic planning. But before he's able to make good on this uh, ambition, he receives a, a letter from University of Chicago economist Jacob Viner, who's in um, Washington working for the Treasury, inviting him to come for three months to work on a, a study of US monetary and banking institutions. Um, he moves to Washington, 34, never looks back. But this is, a man, not a, this is a man who never loses his passion for, shall we say, non-mainstream politics. Let me, again, paint some context for you. What's the world like when Harry Dexter White arrives in Washington? 1933, the FDR administration makes a radical break from the past and gives diplomatic recognition to the Soviet Union. This is a major event. 1934, the Soviets join the League of Nations. This is the background against which um, Harry Dexter White be begins um, uh, an 11-year career as a, shall we say, freelance diplomat. Um, he's 
very passionately against what he sees as the isolationist streak in the United States that, in his view, is holding back history. Um, he um, gets himself enmeshed with a web of fellow travelers in Washington, um, the most famous of which is the um, um, a famous 1930s by Whitaker Chambers, and he begins um, uh, passing classified information to the Soviets through people like um, Chambers. He be begins advocating for the Soviets in uh, policy discussions within the FDR administration. He is very influential in um, uh, getting appointments or keeping posts of people who are of great intelligence to a great value to Soviet military intelligence within the FDR um, uh, administration. Let me just give you one example of um, uh, his activities on behalf of the uh, Soviets where I believe he certainly crossed the line in terms of what was legitimate advocacy. In 1944, uh, Morgenthau put White in charge of producing the occupation currency for post-war Germany. The British accepted the American plan that the currency plates would be um, held in the United States, but the Soviets were very much against this. They wanted um, a duplicate copy of the plates. Everyone involved in the debate within the administration, uh, in particular Alvin Hall, who was head of the Bureau of, of um, uh, Engraving, um, uh, was against this. Um, but there was really an authority vacuum here because Morgenthau had no interest in the subject. Um, in April of 1944, General Marshall cables from Europe after he hears about this debate and says, well, if you decide to go forward with this idea of giving the plates to the Soviets, essentially please don't do it until after May 1st. Um, White completely mischaracterizes this memorandum and tells his colleagues that the um, Joint Chiefs of Staff have ordered that the plates be turned over to the Soviets. Soviets take the plates, print up 78 billion occupation marks. This is more than eight times what the United States prints up. They cash these occupation marks in, um, in Washington, D.C. at the fixed exchange rate established by Harry Dexter White and effectively raid the U.S. Treasury for, in current dollars, four and a half to six billion dollars. And the archival evidence is clear that White knew this was going to happen. In fact, argued to his colleagues that if the Soviets would profit from this transaction, all the better. They were doing heroic things, and we needed to show our appreciation. Uh, I, again, this is a man, I want to emphasize this. This is a, not a man who ever thought of himself as operating against American interests. He was a man who believed that he knew what American interests were and that it was American isolationists who were holding the country back. I would liken him, and per perhaps it helps in a modern context, to somebody like Jonathan Pollard, who almost certainly didn't view himself as operating for Israel against the United States, but believed that US policy was misguided and that the United States should have been doing more for Israel. Likewise, people like Harry Dexter White viewed the Soviets as being allies and believed passionately that they needed to be treated as um, allies. And he was often willing to cross the line in terms of um, legitimate uh, advocacy. Um, now, um, what happens to uh, Harry Dexter White? Well, um, he uh, go goes before the House on American Activities Committee in August of 1948 um, voluntarily to defend himself. He dies of a heart attack two days later. Now, his case becomes very, very controversial among historians, much more controversial than that of Alger Hiss. And the reason, in my view, is that the White case is sort of like a murder mystery where um, you have the witnesses, you have the weapon, as it were, but you have no clear motive. Um, what are the witnesses? We have people like Whitaker Chambers and Elizabeth Bentley, but much more than that. In the late 1990s, uh, we find out through declassified Soviet wartime intelligence cables that the United States had intercepted and decoded um, 
that uh, Harry Dexter White and his activities are mentioned, I found in 18 separate cables. The FBI gave me 13,000 pages of document, uh, documents on, on White under the Freedom of Information Act. I found 18 cables mentioning White and his activities. You have the weapon, as it were. Um, Congressman Richard Nixon in 1950 um, uh, goes before a press conference and waves a handwritten memorandum written by Harry Dexter White, which Whitaker Chambers had turned over to um, Nixon. Um, it was clearly um, written in the mid-1930s. It contains classified information. It, in fact, bangs the reader's um, reader over the head and emphasizing this, it says things like, this is unknown outside the U.S. Treasury. It contains all sorts of information, uh, economic information, it um, uh, contains information on um, Japanese uh, military protection of its oil storage facilities, a remarkable um, range of things. But you have no clear motive. Why would the man have done this? And I think I've been able to shine some light on that. In the course of my research in his archives, I found a handwritten essay of his that apparently nobody had seen before. It was buried in a, a large folder of miscellaneous scribblings. It's probably written in 1944. It's about 30 pages handwritten on his view of what the post-war war world should be. And um, most of the document is devoted to arguing why the US must go into a permanent peacetime alliance with the Soviet Union. He blasts American um, hypocrisy towards the Soviet Union. Um, he uh, uh, blames, quote unquote, rampant imperialism in the United States and the powerful Catholic hierarchy that's stopping this alliance. And then he extols the virtues of Soviet socialism. He ends his essay by paraphrasing the famous radical journalist Lincoln Steffens, who after visiting Petrograd in 1919 famously said, I have seen the future and it works. White writes, the Soviet Union is the first instance of a socialist economy in action and it works, exclamation point. This man is a, is a true believer in the success of the great Soviet experiment with uh, socialism. And you can find in other writings uh, of his and testimony of other people that he believed passionately that after the war, the world is going to be moving in this direction. For example, state trading is going to come to predominate. He believes that the United States can survive as an island of capitalism in a sea of state trading for maybe another five to 10 years, but that's it. So this is the way the world is moving in his view. Now, what impact did White's um, Soviet sympathies have on the outcome at Bretton Woods, which of course is the important question for a lecture like this? Uh, and the answer is not much because there was no Soviet monetary thinking to speak of in the period. So there's, 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 there's no element of White's um, uh, blueprint for the IMF um, uh, that was dictated by the Soviets. Um, most assuredly, he was very solicitous of the Soviet delegation at Bretton Woods, which ex was extremely obstructionist. They were there for only two reasons. One, they wanted to get um, uh, short-term concessionary loans from the United States, which they could repudiate at their convenience. Um, and second, they loved the idea of a new international monetary system being founded at the bottom of the pyramid on gold because the Soviets had a lot of it, um, and particularly buried under the ground. So this would boost the value of their gold stocks. When these loans from the United States were not forthcoming, the Soviets never ratified the IMF Articles of Agreement, much to White's disappointment. But here's the legacy of White's activities that very much lives on to this day in the IMF and the World Bank. I told you I would get to my key anecdote here. Um, in January 1946, President Truman nominates Harry Dexter White to be the first US executive director of the IMF. And he's going to nominate him to be the first managing director, the head of the IMF. But when FBI dire Director J. Edgar Hoover gets wind of this, he prepares a long memorandum for the president arguing, essentially, don't even think about it. I can prove that the man is a Soviet spy. Now, Truman doesn't trust Hoover, but knows that he's got a huge political problem on his hands. 
Um, he sends out feelers to see if he can withdraw the executive director nomination, but finds that it's already gone through a Senate nominating committee. His Treasury Secretary, Fred Vinson, and his um, Secretary of State, James Burns, want the guy out of government entirely, but Truman's, um, Truman's believes that that's too politically difficult at this point, and he argues essentially that they, uh, he can quarantine White as U.S. executive director, but he doesn't go forward with the managing director nomination. Um, uh, the administration concocts this new narrative that they take to the British, in which they say that we decided, after all, in order, quote unquote, to secure the confidence of the American financial community, that we want the World Bank top post, and it would be unfair of us to take both posts. Now, this is um, uh, a United States government that demanded over virulent objections, particularly from Great Britain, that the IMF and World Bank be based not just in the United States, but in Washington to make clear that this was a, these were political institutions. But now they think that they have to be very fair-minded about this and let the Europeans run the IMF. So this is why, to this day, it is a European who runs the International Monetary Fund and not an American. American heads the World Bank. Let me say a little bit about um, what Bretton Woods means for the um, uh, current, current world. Could we, for example, have another Bretton Woods? Um, I should emphasize that there is this very romantic vision of Bretton Woods, not just how it came about, but how it, how it operated. For example, there's this mythology that it worked for a quarter century, roughly from 1945 to 1971. But the first nine European countries to meet the convert currency convertibility requirements in the IMF Articles of Agreement, that is that the currencies be convertible into US dollars, they didn't meet the, these criteria until 1961. By this point, the system is already coming under enormous cons, uh, um, strain because the U.S. is losing gold stocks. That is, we begin running balance of payments deficits. Gold is flooding out of the country. In the 1960s, we keep uh, piling on um, uh, restrictions on uh, dollar convertibility into gold. As you all know, in 1971, uh, after the French send a battleship to New York to pick up their gold from the New York Fed, President Nixon, um, on August 15th, makes an historic announcement that the gold window shall be henceforth closed and the U.S. dollar will never again be convertible into gold. So it really operated for a very short period, um, and that period was one of enormous um, uh, strain. So I don't think it's, a, it's um, a good touchstone for what we should want to go forward with. Now, just as a, a practical political matter, could we ever get the sort of uh, agreement between the world's largest creditor nation and the world's largest debtor nation today that we got at Bretton Woods? Well, the United States is the world's largest creditor nation at Bretton Woods. Britain is the world's largest debtor. Today, China is the world's largest creditor nation. The United States is the world's largest debtor. debtor. Fascinatingly, we use the same language um, in describing the problems of the international monetary system today as Keynes used in the 1940s. For example, in 2010, um, Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner, some of you may remember, called for um, caps to be put on uh, persistent current account surpluses. Of course, this was directed at China. This is pure Keynes. This is exactly the sort of thing that the British were arguing in the 1940s, that the problems in the international monetary system were all caused by the dominant creditor, and it was the United States' behavior that needed to be constrained. Of course, we rejected that view in the 1940s. Likewise, how does China characterize the problems of the international monetary system today? Well, it's all the fault of the profligate debtor nations, specifically, of course, the United States, their loose monetary and fiscal policy. This is exactly the language that we used in the 1940s. But I would argue that there's just no deal to be done between the United States and China. I can give you a, um, a, an example. In 1956, when the Eisenhower administration wanted the British out of Suez, 
the administration threatened to provoke a sterling crisis by withholding emergency IMF uh, assistance um, to the British. Now, we could afford to provoke a sterling crisis in 1956 at no cost to ourselves because U.S. holdings of British securities were trivial, amounting to about $1 per U.S. resident. Chinese holdings of U.S. Um, securities today amount to over $1,000 per Chinese resident. So if China were to threaten to provoke a dollar crisis in order to get us to change our behavior, at least in the short run, they would be hurting their own interest as least, at least as much as they would be hurting our interests. So on that duly pessimistic note, I'll stop and open the things up for questions. One observation and one question. Are you aware of an anecdote uh, regarding the uh, one of the leaders of the Canadian delegation at Bretton Woods, Lou Rasminski, who was in the Can Canadian Canada's uh, central bank? He was in charge of the drafting committee for the communique at the end. And he had great difficulty in getting everyone to focus. So he hired a belly dancer. <laughs> and got the belly dancer up the Bretton Woods and uh, agreed that she would perform on condition that these guys got together and put together a draft that he wanted. I found that story in the Journal of Commerce and I actually uh, went to uh, Resvinsky's daughter in Toronto and confirmed that it's true. <laughs> but I had not seen that in any of the history books. Uh, the question is, who was supporting uh, in, the, in the exchequer, Keynes, who was, who was, who was uh, you say that Clark really was a kingpin in, 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 the, in the treasury. The <laughs> Who in the, in the political system was supporting Keynes to represent the UK at Bretton Woods? Um, Keynes was supported, I would say, weekly by successive chancellors, not out of great conviction that the man would succeed, but out of desperation. Um, none of the British establishment, Lord Halifax, Lord Lothian, could um, loosen American purse strings. Um, uh, so they decided to go with someone who had what the Americans respected, which was star power. As I said, this, this, the American media was just fascinated with this man. And from his first official trip to Washington during the Second World War, he was literally surrounded by the American media, and the British were very proud of this. There's a, a great piece of British doggerel from the period that goes like this. In Washington, Lord Halifax once whispered to Lord Keynes, it's true they have the money bags, but we have all the brains. <laughs> now, brains in the end didn't count for anything, um, but Keynes was a remarkable bewitcher. Um, and the way he handled the incoming labor government in um, uh, 1946 was brilliant. Um, he convinced them that he should go back to Washington and negotiate American um, post-war um, uh, transition assistance. And he laid out for them three alternatives. The first was temptation. Temptation is to take yet another American loan. And he argued this would be an absolute moral abomination because of all we did while the Americans sat at home sitting out the war, all we did for the common cause, all the blood that we shed. We will not take another loan from them. Second option was austerity. I don't have to spend a lot of time on that. Keynesian economics is not typically associated with austerity. That option was thrown out, no austerity. The last option was justice. The Americans will essentially pay us for our efforts in the common cause while they were sitting comfortably um, uh, at home. They will write us a check, a big check, which of course is what we did a few years later on the Marshall Plan. But in um, uh, late 1945, the US administration was not interested in this argument. And um, uh, he, he was dismissed rather brutally. Um, Keynes actually spent four months negotiating in Washington from September to December of 1945. 
The British government was getting angrier and angrier um, at him because he was cabling home saying, basically, we have to take temptation. And he had persuaded the British government that he was going to come home with, a, with a, a load of cash, no strings attached, no loans. And now he's begging the British government to take a loan, another loan, on American terms. And uh, at one point, um, Hugh Dalton, the, the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, become, he, who has a PhD, by the way, in uh, economics, um, is furious and decides to replace him as head of the negotiating delegation. This is November 45. And this is the closest the British come to walking away from Bretton Woods. Um, Halifax goes to um, Treasury Secretary Vincent and says very graciously, um, at this point, we've reached uh, um, an impasse. Uh, there's no question of our ratifying Bretton Woods right now. It has to be ratified according to the agreement in July 1944 by December 31st, um, 1945. We're not going to do it. Um, at some point in the future, we can um, revisit this, but we can't do it now. Thank you very much. Essentially, goodbye. Uh, at that point, the Americans start, as we say, playing ball. They can't afford for the British to walk away because there is no international agreement without the British um, Empire. Um, and so slowly we start um, conceding on some of the terms. For example, giving Britain a longer time to make its currency um, uh, convertible. So these were um, achievements, minor ones, <laughs> which were only achieved after um, Keynes um, had begun to be pushed aside. Keynes, in almost every major um, meeting with um, uh, his US counterparts, threatened to walk out. He was constantly threatening to storm out. But the Americans always knew he would never leave because he wanted to be the father of a new international monetary system. Um, the Americans treated him very well at Bretton Woods. He was given a beautiful room at the ho hotel, um, uh, for example. Um, he was allowed to make the closing speech at Bretton Woods, but he was not going to be able, um, allowed to influence actual um, policy. Yes? How did he speak to the interest of the countries during this time? Um, you can, at Bretton Woods, you can almost see the empire collapsing before your eyes. Um, not, it wasn't just the common, I mean, the, the Canadians were um, fairly supportive of um, the British, although their own plan um, for Bretton Woods was so similar to White's plan in the British mind that they referred to it as off-white. <laughs> um, but the Indian delegation at Bretton Woods um, was in open revolt. They were demanding in public sessions right in front of the British that the Americans do something to make the British pay back their debts. And remember how the Br British accumulated these debts. They didn't go to the Indians, for example, and say, could we borrow some money? They would pay the Indians for things they brought back to Britain in sterling and tell the Indians you can't convert the stuff. So the Indians can't buy anything with this. It is worthless. And they're demanding that the Americans at Bretton Woods force convertibility on the British. The British are livid and humiliated by this. Um, Lionel Robbins talks about how humiliating it is having the Indians do this in public right in front of them. They're, they understand that this is all coming to an end, but they were hoping that the Indians and, the other, and others would do it quietly, behind the scenes. We'll take ca care of this in private. You know, don't air the family disputes in public, please. But you can see the whole thing collapsing um, uh, uh, at, Bretton, at Bretton Woods. It, it's, it's even in there in the archival uh, evidence. Uh, the uh, loan that the uh, that, uh, presumably the, uh, the Wall Street financiers were willing to make to uh, to England 
What was in their mind here? Was, uh, were they trying to prop up the uh, uh, the empire? Absolutely not. I mean, they 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 had some conditions. For example, on um, rough boundaries on the sterling dollar exchange rate. Um, but they wanted the IMF to fail. They viewed the IMF as being a competitor institution, a government-run, Democrat government-run um, competitor institution. Interestingly enough, they liked the World Bank. Um, why? Because the World Bank was going to guarantee private loans. This is like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac for Countrywide, right? <laughs> this is a good deal. Um, so they were all for um, uh, the World Bank, which in particular makes a mockery of what Vincent told Keynes about um, why the U.S. decided it wanted the World Bank in order to secure the confidence of the American financial community. That was nonsense. They had the confidence of the American financial community on the World Bank. It was the IMF that they, they didn't, didn't like. Wall Street got uh, Eugene Meyer and Gene Black uh, exactly. their own, their own uh, as, as presidents of the World Bank in the early days. That's right. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, so Roosevelt himself was quite anti-colonial, but he was also quite pro-British. And I'm curious how clued in he was to uh, what Morgan thought and, and White were up to. He said that he wasn't much interested in uh, uh, um, he, he, like Churchill, didn't really pay terribly much attention. There were times at which he was forced to pay attention. For example, um, uh, uh, at the um, uh, uh, um, Atlantic Charter discussion, so this is 1941 um, with Churchill, um, the State Department and, and the Treasury are both putting enormous pressure on the British to agree to so-called Article 7, which is basically an end to imperial preference. And Churchill pleads with um, Roosevelt, um, saying, you know, you can't make me go before Parliament with, with this. I can't, I just can't do it. There'll be an um, uh, open revolt. And Roosevelt actually writes personal correspondence to Churchill saying, it's the furthest thing from my mind that I would use Lend-Lease aid in order to force an end to imperial preference. The State Department in particular are furious about this. Cordell Hall is a fierce um, uh, a free trader and uh, views imperial preference as a moral abomination, but Roosevelt wants to get this deal done. Now, Roosevelt doesn't keep his word, um, and this causes um, Churchill grievous difficulties before uh, Parliament um, uh, some, some years later. But it's not because Roosevelt um, actually did want to use Lend-Lease with these ulterior motives um, in, in mind. It was his treasury in particular, and to some degree his State Department that decided that they could use this to get these concessions. And Congress was very, very useful to them for this. Um, the Lend-Lease legislation that went through Congress in 1942 uh, demanded that um, um, the um, US get, quote unquote, consideration for Lend-Lease aid. Now, Roosevelt had argued that Lend-Lease aid was itself in American national interest. So the idea of consideration was not his. This was um, uh, imposed by Congress. But it was the Treasury that decided to define consideration in these broader geopolitical terms. Yes? One of the uh, not, as, not terribly well-known bits of uh, historiography of the Soviet policy of the origin of the Cold War is Lots of evidence that people in Moscow, including Stalin, were expecting U.S.-U.K. clashes. Yes. Political clashes uh, in the classic mode of Lenin's theory of imperialism. You know, that the capitalists could never rearrange it. You know the story. Yeah. And I just wonder the degree to which, there's two questions I have. And that this, this expectation that the U.S. and U.K., because of their huge contra inter-imperialist contradictions, would never be able to cooperate. Ultimately, they're just going to fall out. Uh, 
may have played into various things the Soviet Union did. So I had two questions about this. One is, White's communications with his Soviet interlocutors, um, would they have gone be, could someone receiving those interpret them as, to, as in this manner, as being consistent with this? In other words, would he have been a source of intelligence that suggested that real, real breakdown in political relations between the U.S. and U.K. were possible? That's one question. Is it, is it consistent with that? And secondly, at what point would this have stopped? In other words, you talked about you did you gave a snapshot of the picture as the Bretton Woods, where the expectation was this post World War II or with the Soviet Union, you know, all the four assumptions, and then the 1947 assumptions. When do you think, in that interval, you know, it would have been it should have become it should have become clear that um, the U.S. and the U.K. actually were going to end up in the same camp? Does that make great sense? question? All right, let me start with the second one first and work backwards. Um, Truman, as you're you you you're aware, when he became president, had absolutely no intention of making fundamental changes to Rooseveltian foreign policy, in particular as regards the Soviet Union. Um, uh, at Potsdam, for example, he talked glowingly about Stalin and how he could do business with this man. But it became clear over the course of 1946, in particular early 47, that Stalin was not keeping his, his word. And a different cast of characters were now in charge behind the scenes. And this is perhaps where, uh, and I, I know I have temerity to even challenge people like Gaddis who have written about this period, but they always look at the top down. You know, compare Truman to Roosevelt. There's validity in that. But the key players under them had changed. The State Department under Roosevelt, as you know, had very little influence. And Morgenthau, through White, was really making foreign policy. I talked, for example, in what's turned out to be a controversial segment of the book, the, the role White played in the crafting of the 10 points note, ultimatum to Japan, in 1941. It was really the Treasury that was making foreign policy, not just foreign economic policy. After Truman becomes president, he basically pushes Morgenthau to resign. Um, Vincent, his new Treasury Secretary, hates White. Byrne hates White. They want him out of government. Sticking him in the IMF is one way to do it. And now the State Department comes back into power. And so um, some key players emerge who were essentially marginalized under Roosevelt. The most obvious one is George Kennan, um, who now becomes extremely influential through his long telegram. But there are other players who become very important, who have a very different vision of the world. Will Clayton, um, and, and, um, who's um, head of economic policy within the State Department. He has a very different vision from uh, um, uh, White and Morgenthau. In many senses, he can be said to be the father of the Marshall Plan in terms of the, the details of it. So you have a very different cast of characters coming around. And after um, Truman's uh, tr famous Truman Doctrine speech in um, um, uh, spring of 47, um, this cast of characters truly takes charge. Um, and they don't, they don't have any personal connection with these people who, um, who were uh, influential under Roosevelt, quite the opposite. They didn't like them. They didn't think much of them. Um, uh, Truman thought Morgenthau was an idiot. Um, I can't even repeat some of the words in public he used about um, Morgenthau. So all these people who were incredibly influential in terms of creating this Bretton Woods vision are gone. They're off the stage. Still, this is a very, very radical break in terms of uh, vision during the period. I don't know how, how you feel about whether, how accurate a characterization that is, but that's what I see going on. Your um, uh, first question about White and his feelings towards the British and how that might have been communicated to the Soviet 
I've seen nothing in any of White's communications with the Soviets where um, he refers spe specifically to U.S.-British relations. I'm not saying it's not there, but for example, I didn't see anything in the 18 cables. Um, it, White really is looking beyond the British. Um, for example, um, he was uh, a technical advisor in San Francisco in spring of 45. And he's feeding um, American negotiating positions to um, a TASS news journalist named Pravdin, who, of course, is um, part of uh, Soviet military intelligence. And he tells them some rather valuable things. For example, um, that the, the U.S. Uh, administration is willing to pay any cost to get an agreement um, at San Francisco, including giving the Soviets veto power. Now, once the Soviets knew that they could get veto power, they decided they were going to stay engaged with this. So that's the sort of information that White was giving them. White, for example, was telling them that they could ask for a greater um, um, uh, post-war transition assistance from the United States than they had asked for. For example, they were trying to get three billion. White told them through an American intermediary that they could ask for 10 billion. That's the figure he was advocating um, for. Roosevelt said absolutely no. Um, there was nothing in anything that I've seen of his communications that referred specifically to U.S. British relations. But the point you made, I actually make in my book that al although um, this Marxist view of the inherent uh, um, uh, tensions within the capitalist um, uh, world would ultimately uh, ensure that this all, all, all falls apart may have been nonsense. But the Soviets did, whether for good reason or not, seem to comprehend the enormous tensions between the US and the British. And these had enormous repercussions in 1947. And the, the empire only collapsed as violently as it did because of um, what uh, Morgenthau and White had done. Weren't uh, Morgenthau and his father before him originally Wall Street uh, banker types? Um, not, 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 not Henry Morgenthau, not, not the Morgenthau at Bretton Woods. No, not, not, not to, not to my knowledge. Um, as I said, he was a gentleman apple farmer, as he called himself. I wonder where the money came from. I don't, I, I really don't, I, I've read about the family background, um, but I, I really don't recall it well. Um, but he certainly knew nothing about economics. And he wasn't very, he was shocked when he was uh, appointed Treasury Secretary in January of 1934. He was 43 years old. Um, again, the, he was, had none of the knowledge background you would expect for one to be appointed Treasury Secretary. Yeah. Uh, the speculative question. Uh, if Dexter White had lived, um, and I, I didn't realize, I, I guess I'd forgotten he was at Lawrence College in Appleton, Wisconsin, where Senator McCarthy came from. Do you think he would have been indicted? That's a great question. I've asked myself, yeah, I, I, I'm a big runner. I go running on the East River every weekend, my son in the stroller, and I ask myself this question. <laughs> um, because you know, most of the intellectuals yeah. in the ninth, late 1930s were, were, were of, of a mind with Harry Dexter White. But yeah. He he could, but you know, I'm not a lawyer. But you know, as you know, Hiss was uh, eventually convicted only of perjury, yeah. right? Yeah. So in theory, White could have been convicted of perjury. Yeah. And in fact, Nixon seemed to have been trying to set White up for a perjury charge um, in his grilling of White um, uh, in the House on Un American Activities Committee, committee hearings. Most of these guys were grandstanding, but not Nixon. He was very forensic. He kept asking White over and over again in different ways, do you know Whitaker Chambers? Have you ever met Whitaker Chambers? And White, I should emphasize, really turned in a bravado performance at this testimony. He was getting thunderous applause from the peanut gallery. 
But in response to these questions, he didn't sound very strong. He kept stating over and over again, I do not recall. He was clearly trying to protect himself against a perjury charge. So the question is, in my mind, could he have been convicted of perjury? It might have been difficult to convict him of much more. Now, once the Venona decrypts were out, maybe. But remember, um, uh, the, the CIA, FBI, they didn't want this stuff declassified. It wasn't even declassified until 1995. So I don't know what they would have been willing to do with it. Um, Hoover, when he made his charges to Truman against White in 46, his first memo um, to the um, administration was actually in November of 45. He didn't know about Venona. Um, I found that the first um, uh, FBI memo referencing a Venona cable uh, was not until 1950. The first, these were, these were, these were a Soviet intelligence cables that were uh, intercepted during the war um, and up until 1946, a little bit after the war. Um, but but the, so the first ones were not decrypted until after the war was already over. The first one mentioning white, not until 1950. Mm -hmm. And the last cables that were decrypted, believe it or not, were not until 1980. So the first evidence we had from Venona about White is not until 1950. It's not clear to me what use um, the government would have made of this. So perhaps perjury, yeah. but I'm not sure if it would have been more than that. Yeah. Do you see the, uh, the current uh, breakdown of the current petrodollar system as being analogous to the, breakdown of the, the petrodollar system? The current system. The what dollar system? Petro petrodollar. petrodollar system? Petrodollar. Yeah, and uh, you're talking about in the... the no, as, as the British <laughs> then. What, what are you defining as the petrodollar system? Well, that, that oil is paid, that the dollar is used uh, universally as payment for oil and international trade. Um, well, I'm, these, as you know, were very important in the 1970s. You don't think so? It's still Pet petrol dollars? You're, you're in, in geopolitical. Can you give me an example of what, what you have in mind? Central banks all hold dollars in order to trade as a universal uh, basis of trade. So right. Yes. Um, do, you not, do you see that system falling apart now? Um, and, and how does that go forward? Yeah. Um, uh, the, in, in my view, the dollar plays um, a, a, an absolutely critical role in the multilateral trading system because it's the only currency that other countries are willing to stockpile. In other words, that they believe rightly or wrongly that over time this stuff will roughly maintain its global purchases. That's the, the crisis though, right? That's what? It's not since 2008 though. I think that's all, all bets are off since. Right. Um, now, but since 2008, China, for example, has um, signed agreements with Japan, Brazil, Russia, and Turkey to start trading without U.S. dollars. Now, of course, this is in its embryonic stages. But if you stop to think about how this would play out, um, um, if it were to become real, I think it's very worrying. And the reason is this. None of these countries are actually willing to stockpile the currencies of the others. For example, there's no way China would be willing to stockpile rubles. In other words, be willing to finance a trade imbalance with Russia. So what would they do? Um, they, all of these countries would start managing their trade with each other bilaterally to keep their trade balanced. If everybody tries to maintain a bilateral trade balance with everybody else, then the multilateral trading system literally falls apart. And so with, without the US dollar, I think we are headed in the direction of trade war. That is a 
collapse of the multilateral trading system. So I'm much less optimistic, for example, than people like Barry Eichengreen, who believe that a multipolar currency world could sustain a multilateral trading system. Okay, well, we've come to, uh, to the witching hour. Uh, ben, I want to thank you for an absolutely uh, fascinating and engaging uh, lecture today. It was terrific. Thank you so much for coming up to the Upper Valley to uh, discuss partnership.